right, buckle up. It's time for today's edition of The Public Square from the American Policy Roundtable with Dave Zanotti, Rob Walgate, and Sherry Eisen is here as well, Jeff Sanders and Alan C. Duncan. I'm Wayne Shepard, and the topic under discussion today is Article 3 of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Let's join the team. Dave? Thanks, Wayne. When I think about disqualification or disqualified, I'm sorry, I've got to go back to golf scorecards, right? How many great tournaments have been lost because somebody had a mistake on their scorecard? Right. I mean, still the most amazing thing in sports. Everyone that's on the grounds, everyone watching on TV can know what the score is. But yet if a competitor signs their name to an incorrect scorecard, even though they know what the correct one is, and so does everyone else, they're disqualified. Yep. There was a case when the Masters was, was lost. Yes. Because someone signed an incorrect scorecard. And it's called being disqualified. Uh, you, you just, it, it, you're DQ'd. And, and that is like the worst two letters in the world of golf. For a lot of people, it's the best two letters in the world of ice cream. Uh, they, 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 you know, so, so, <laughs> My I mean, wife loves yeah. that. Yeah, yes, so, so DQ. C- clearly these things, are, you know, the, now we're talking about DQ in a whole different point of view. And that has to do with the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution and the question of whether or not Donald Trump is legally permitted to run for the presidency. Small disclaimer, those that are friends and and listeners of the public square for a long period of time by now are are exhausted with us continually reminding people that even in the most intense political seasons, we do not endorse candidates for the presidency. So in addition to that, we don't take money from political parties. We don't take money from candidates. By and large, the political parties dislike us equally because we challenge the validity of their existence based upon the writings of Washington and Adams and our practical experience of the factions that have divided us for the purposes of political power. We're not into the parties. So if you're looking you know, to, to, to play the silo game with us, you're going to be uncomfortable. And we would invite you, if, if that's where you are, and this is not an attempt to be condescending, but if you find yourself triggered, if you find yourself, your blood pressure is rising because you've already heard the name of Donald Trump, which is not very often spoken on this broadcast, Uh, Not for any particular reason, except that we find that when everyone's talking about something, we should talk about something else. But in this case, there's a lot of early, I would say, scuttlebutt about the 14th Amendment and the presidential election. This is in our realm of influence. This is the stuff that we do. We get involved in constitutional legal debates in regards to how they apply to the actual walking out of what it means to be an American citizen. We've been doing that for 43 years. So we're kind of up on this stuff. And we believe in the rule of law. Yeah. That's very important. And we believe in standing on those principles. Even when you don't like it. Even when we don't like it, and even when we don't like, or we do like, who is in office. Sometimes people's opinion of what the law should be or how it should be enforced changes based on the letter next to someone's name that's in a position of authority. Yeah. We saw that. It was very evident during COVID. Well, I think you and I are tied with the number of governors that we've sued. (laughs) I mean, literally sued. uh, And and what Uh, this comes down to is people think, because a lot of conservatives listen to this broadcast, that then this, of course, would be a Republican broadcast. We have sued more Republican governors for breaking the law than we have Democrat governors. All right, so I have to throw in there. Over 43 years, just a matter of record. Yeah, I have to throw in there. It would have been January of 2002. I was in Daytona Beach, Florida at Major League Baseball umpiring school. And the the crazy thing is now, as as my friend Paul Tesori would say, don't tell stories with dates because people can fact check everything. (laughs) Stories were a lot better before Google existed. But it would have been January 2002. I was in Major League Baseball umpiring school in Florida, and my mom called me. And she said, I just talked. This is before I worked at Roundtable. I started here in the spring of 2003. She said, I just talked with Dave Zanotti and Patty. would have been Patty. Patty Hollow. Patty Patty Hollow at the time. Yes, her secret Um, code name. And... They want us to join them in a lawsuit against the governor of the state of Ohio. And I'm like, what? They want <laughs> what? What? Say that again? So um, we made the mistake of praying about it, and we joined the lawsuit. <laughs> we we knew we were supposed to join the lawsuit against um, Governor Taft at the time yeah. in the yeah. state of Ohio. So, yeah, yeah, we've sued some governors. Yeah. And it's crazy how I remember 
those details. I guess the first time you see sue a governor, you remember where you were. Yeah. <laughs> when you see your name on the top of the paper. Well, yeah. Rob, I think that's a good story for your memoirs, which oh. I keep telling you that you need to write. So I just let's uh, tuck that one away and bring it, bring it back out. <laughs> so, so the point is that we are for the rule of law. We're for constitutional government and for, we, we exist to help bring us back to an understanding of the principles upon which those documents stand. And we are unashamed of the fact that those principles come from a biblical or a Judeo-Christian worldview. Um, and we refuse to be ashamed of hope because we have hope. We have hope because the world is bigger than us. America is bigger than us. The truth is bigger than us, which means there's somebody else involved in this other than just us. And so our job is to try to reflect the light that we discover, not that we invent. So we're getting into a conversation right now that has very large political ramifications across the country. And it really does, if you decide to study this story, you're going to find out, it, it would be like a, uh, a crash course uh, on how the factions and money players in American politics line up to control the power of the administrative state and the federal budget. Because that's what every presidential election is about. It's not about the characters who run. It's not about the parties that run them. It's about who will control the budget and then the administrative state, because that is where the power is in America, according to what most people believe. And when we talk about the individual whose name we mentioned before, President Trump, has there ever been a more polarizing figure one way or the other, whether you love him or you hate him, or no. you're in the middle? I mean, it's no no one, when that name is mentioned, no one ever says, well, I'm, I'm indifferent. And I think no. that skews people's thoughts on whatever the issue is yeah, when and it, it comes to it. And also, I mean, clearly it amplifies our one of our serious flaws as a nation, which is our addiction to the White House yes. and to the presidential elections, to the demise of our Constitution and our form of representative government as a republic. Um, we're way out of whack there, and we're not going to fix that in one radio program. We may not fix that in one lifetime, but ultimately America will have to fix that problem because it is an unsustainable reality. We continue to trend more and more and more to a dictatorship, no matter which party's in power or which candidate's in power, which candidate's elected, because the goal of the administrative state is to have this thing straight-lined as much as is possible. And that shouldn't surprise us. That's where Woodrow Wilson started with progressivism, is to move us off of a constitutional representative republic and into a more British form of system where you have a parliament and you have the prime minister selected within the context of those seats, and then you have a monarchy. And you just he just liked the cool kids and the powerful people telling everybody what else, what else to do uh, more than the American system. Well, well, now they don't even like the British, uh, const, uh, British parliamentary system. It's uh, a, a lot of elitists here in America look to the, the Politburo in Beijing actually as their model. See how they can get things done so quickly? Hmm. Yeah. So here we've got the situation of DQ, the disqualification of Donald Trump. And it begins with a discussion about the Constitution. Now, let's put this in historical context. The Constitution, 14th Amendment, Jeff, we're talking about those that package of amendments that came to the United States as the final redress to the question of slavery at the end of the Civil War. There is no way these amendments exist short of the Civil War. There's no way they exist short of the issue of resolving slavery. This is what America struggled with from 17, uh, actually from even before that. I mean, from the very beginning of America, uh, this has been a question because slavery was legal in the world and what would happen to the colonies. It was a question in the colonies. It was a question during the Declaration of Independence. It was a question during the Constitution in 1787. And America wrestled with that question. And these amendments, in essence, settled that argument that there would be no slavery in this country. Now, the provision still permits slavery as a form of criminal punishment or involuntary servitude. So there, there is still these tiny little provisos left that have nothing to do with slavery as we understood slavery in this country. Slavery as we understood it uh, is gone. And that's what these amendments are put together. And I don't care whether you're Democrat, Republican, what color your skin is, that's just history. You can't reinvent that. So you can't make these things to be more than what they were designed to be because that's what they're designed to be. And in addition to that, there was a little kicker on the out 
on the 14th Amendment, Article 3. That's because the folks that were running Congress faced the significant burden of how do you put a country back together again that's just been through the most devastating civil war you can possibly imagine. Well, they split. The 11 states of the Confederacy left. Now they're coming back, and the intention on both sides is to bring them back. Uh, Robert E. Lee wanted them back uh, in the Union. We, we, he wanted to bring things back together. The, the North wanted to bring things back together. Problem is they didn't want the South to become too powerful in Congress. They didn't want to become too powerful too quickly. And they did, certainly didn't want the former combatants of the Confederacy, particularly the officers, to come back and serve in Congress and make life sort of a miserable reminder for everybody. The federal government actually divided the con former Confederacy into four military districts in which were, they were governed directly by Union generals. And their statehoods were actually taken away. And they had to reapply and were readmitted to the Union on a piece by now, piece basis. Tennessee being really, the first one really being brought important back. Thought because if you we you could we could go like hours just on the process of reconstruction and the whole concept that did the Southern states actually leave the Union because Lincoln never never proclaimed that they actually had left the Union. Then why after his death his tragic assassination by a rebel supporter? Why in fact then did they have to be permitted to come back in. You know, and it was yeah. Lincoln constituted the entire state of affairs during the Civil War as if they hadn't technically left, that they were just in a rebellion, that the bad people had taken them away, but they weren't really gone. But then to get back in, you had to go through all these steps and processes. Right. It's a very fascinating, it's, it's a worthwhile study in history. But to get now to the point of the 14th Amendment, Article 3, we get to the fact that there is a clause that, or the, the, the Article 3 reads quite simply, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having pre previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof, but Congress may by a vote of two-thirds of each house remove such disability. Okay. Everybody got that? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So what does that mean? Does it mean that Donald Trump is disqualified? Well, we'll let that question linger in the air for just a moment. You're listening to The Public Square. Great conversation ahead on today's program, which if you can't stay with us, you can always listen to online at thepublicsquare.com or by using our smartphone app. It's free in the App Store, the App Store of your choice, The Public Square. We will be right back for more on The Public Square. Just a few moments ago, Dave Zanotti asked the question, is Donald Trump disqualified from being president again? Let's get back to the conversation now with the team here at the Public Square. Dave? Before we go much farther, there's an important little caveat we've got to say here about what terms mean what. Let me reread that 14th Amendment in part. It talks about all the different people, no person, senator, representative, and all the other people who have previously taken an an oath, and that is the oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution. Or as an executive or judi judicial officer of any state, to, if they took the oath to, quote, support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. You notice it doesn't say an oath to the government. It says an oath to the Constitution. And you'll also notice that we're talking about insurrection or rebellion. We're not talking about treason or sedition. Now, those are different words. They mean different things. So, Jeff, let's talk about how this applied then to the Confederate officers uh, as, as to what then happened. Well, from the Union perspective, the Confederacy was uh, in an act of insurrection and or rebellion against the federal government. The Confederates, such as Lee or Beauregard or Stonewall Jackson or any of these others, would never have said that they were in an act of insurrection. Their states, which were created before there was the United States, 
their states voluntarily left the Union. So there, and they resigned on good terms, as any U.S. officer can do at any time. They resigned from the United States military. And they said, Lee said, actually, that he would never draw his sword against the federal government, the U.S. government, except in defense of his state. And he was true to his word. So when the United States Army came across the Potomac River and, and invaded his state, actually invaded his house, which is right across the Potomac, he said, all right, now I will defend my home. How is that insurrection? How is that rebellion when 75,000 right, well, troops me, are invading your home? And that is not treason. But either. let me answer that question because the, the other side of that coin is that by leaving the Union, mm -hmm. they were in fact in insurrection against the Union because the Union held a theory, as did Lincoln, on the concept of the perpetual Union. When you got started and said, we're forming this country, there's no exemption clause. There was no walk away statement. Now it, it was a it's a fair it, the argument still goes on today. Yeah, sure. Right? Is is when they signed up and started the nation, was there a clause that says if you want out, this is how you get out? So I can never get out of a contract right. then. No, that's not the same thing. And see, this is how you can start a war. Because you get to comparing apples and oranges and people solidify on their points of definition. Right? One held to the concept of perpetual union, one said as Pickett was quoted in the movie Gettysburg. It was like a gentleman's club yeah. and we no longer consent. And so they decided to walk away voluntarily. They were not advocating the overthrow of Washington, D.C. Correct. They did not want to end the remaining United States of America. They started their own country. They believed that they did the same thing that their fathers did and their grandfathers did when they started the country in the first place. Right. right? However, the argument was, no, you start a country one time and you signed and those people signed into a point of perpetual union. Now, you got to remember, this is pretty interesting and we're a little bit, we're sliding into the weeds here, I, I realize. But uh, who was Light Horse Harry Lee? That was uh, one of George Washington's officers in the American Revolution and the father of Robert Edward Lee. So Robert E. Lee's dad yeah. worked for... Mm -hmm. George Washington. A lot of the Confederate officers. He fathers, served under Washington. Joseph Johnston, right. his dad fought for, in the American Patrick Revolution. Patrick Henry's uh, relatives were on the side of the Confederacy. Yep. I mean, the, uh, Woodrow Wilson had people on the side of the Confederacy. That's correct. Uh, and, and Mary Todd Lincoln had family Bro on the she side had of brothers, the Confederacy. She had her yeah. brothers who were fighting in the Confederate yeah. Army. Yeah, this was tough. This was very, very tough. And it was a philosophical debate uh, about who had the right to do what. And in the midst of all of that debate was the other issue, the issue of slavery, the issue of slavery, which really brought all of this into the fruition. Now, they went to war. This was not our war. It was their war. They went to war. And we can't relitigate it, and it would be foolish to try. They went to war, and they ran themselves to the end of war. And they were exhausted. That, you know when war ends? When one side gives up. When people decide we just can't take anymore, we just can't. or either one side is completely annihilated or they simply have lost the will to go any farther. And when when Americans finally quit that war, they really, truly wanted to quit that war. But there was a fear that perhaps in Congress there would be a problem with permitting the leadership of the Confederacy to now serve in the leadership of the Congress. So they decided they would pass the 14th Amendment. Now, what's interesting about the 14th Amendment was the last part of it. You got it up, Jeff? I got it. All right, what's the very last part? <clears throat> or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But, but. Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. Here's the part that's never talked about. They passed the 14th Amendment that says you can't can't be here. And then when they tried walking it out, it didn't work very well. Yeah. Um, and there were, a, a, for the next 10 years under Reconstruction, there were many Southerners who were seething under Reconstruction and saying, well, you know, we don't, you know, all of our constitutional rights are gone. And this is what they were saying. And they would like to have their own representatives. Now, I'm referring specifically to the white Southerners, not to the black Southerners who did have representation in Congress. 
So later, uh, Reconstruction was done away with, and they brought the rest, the remainder of the states in. They removed the military from from the South, and they and Congress allowed now former Confederate generals to be elected to. How government. could they do that? They had a they uh, uh, Congress allowed that two thirds vote. They passed a vote that, according to this Constitution, yes. this was an amendment that was written with a way of canceling its very existence out right in the language. The last part of the language says, unless Congress by two thirds decides to drop the prohibition, they passed two separate amnesty laws as permitted in this country. And they, and they basically made it go away. In essence, the 14th amendment was abolished, if you will, by two acts of Congress as it was permitted to be done because there was no more Confederacy. There are no more Confederate officers. It's no longer a part of what anything that's necessary because it dealt with the problem. And then, I mean, can you believe this? These folks had the foresight to say, we're not letting you back in. But, uh, uh, but, but if we're wrong about that, then here's how you can come back in. And wouldn't you know, they let him back in. They did it for the 36th and 37th Congress. Yeah. Yeah. They Senator for- uh, John Gordon, Fort Gordon in Georgia is named after him, or they changed the name just recently, but Senator John Gordon was uh, former General John Gordon, who was wounded about, I don't know, 10 times in battle. Tough guy, really tough guy. And, and he was not alone. There were many other officers who were later elected to uh, state and federal offices and judgeships and so forth. So this is the history of the 14th Amendment. It is a fascinating history. Um, it, it has great horror, sadness. It also has uh, almost a sense of redemption. Reconciliation. And reconciliation yeah. built within it. Yeah. It makes so much sense. And, and they, they did it. This is the thing. America's got, uh, what did I say last, a couple of weeks ago we were laughing? Uh, America's one of the greatest places to live is if you keep one eye closed. You know, it's the same, <laughs> same thing with his, history. If you keep one eye closed, America's history is amazing. No, there's two sides mm-hmm. of American history. We've always known that. Why? Because we're not afraid of the reality that humans are fallen. It's a part of the worldview that we have adopted as people of faith. We understand people mess up. Everybody falls down. And the question is, how do you get up? Learn from them. We make mistakes. We Every all do. Every day. Oh, we all do so. Every and America's day. made plenty of mistakes and, yet, and, and paid unbelievable prices. I will say yep. also that many of those Confederate officers after the Civil War realized and admitted openly that they made mistakes and made very strong attempts at reconciliation towards black and white. People like Nathan Bedford Forrest, people like Pierre Beauregard, uh, John Mosby. I could go on and on. Now, some were said, you know, slavery was good and we're not asking for any forgiveness at all. But others did say that we were wrong and we should never have had slavery in the first place. As a, and as a country, uh, we, th- this, is, this was one of the tools that enabled us to get it right. I find it today, you know, and young people, they have to learn from mistakes. And I know we bring up sports a lot, but how do you learn from mistakes? You watch games or practices and you see and you study. You study those mistakes and you correct them. We need to do a better job studying history. Okay, that is, in essence, the premise of the 14th Amendment. Now, granted, we, we've, we've probably missed about four hours of additional conversation that could be added, but it's the right. outline of the premise of how we got to the 14th Amendment. And we're not making any apologies or taking any credit. We're just saying that was the history of then that we have inherited. We weren't there. We weren't there. All we can do is learn from it. So, does that 14th Amendment disqualify Donald Trump to be president of the United States? Uh, and then how would that happen? And here's, let's set this story up now for the contemporary reality of this. Uh, there are, well, how would you get a presidency manipulated in the position where you could say that the 14th Amendment actually applied today after what we just heard about the history? Well, it goes back to January 6th. In the event of January 6th, that it can be interpreted with any set of words that you want. The words that were quickly laid upon that event by the media and by the Democrat Party were, was, the, was the single word insurrection. And when we heard that, I think most people just went right past that. Insurrection, okay, what do you call it? Whatever you want to call it, a riot, call it a protest, call it a, a criminal trespassing, call it stupid. You could call it a lot of things. There's no defense for the event here. All right. Uh, that What happened, happened. It got called an insurrection. 
And it's critical to understand that because of the labeling of that event with that single word, everything we're about to talk to about from this point forward now has to do with Donald Trump. A fascinating history behind the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, as discussed by our team here at the Public Square. But they're not finished. There's more to come, including Alan has a question about defining what we mean by insurrection. That's ahead on the Public Square. the light of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. All right, let me reset the table here at the public square. At the table today, Dave Zanotti, Rob Walgate, Alan C. Duncan, our producer, and Jeff Sanders, and Sherry Eisen is here as well, all making up the conversation panel on the public square. We're online at thepublicsquare.com, and you'll find us through our smartphone app, The Public Square, if you'd like to listen to this program again or download it and share it with other people. All right, Alan, you have a question to lead off this segment. We're talking a lot about the word insurrection, but have we defined it? Uh, and and have we defined it as they would have used the word when the 14th Amendment was written? Okay, let's go back to first principles of legal construction. We're talking about the Constitution now. We're not talking about statute. The idea when you put together a Constitution is that you want the words to be as self-explanatory as possible because when you're dealing with a Constitution, you're dealing with big blocks of issues, and they're the big, like the large size stones, the big blocks that you can see, you know what color they are, you know what shape they are, and you move them over here because this is where you want them. When you start to parse out the fine points of law, that's what statutory law is about because there's plenty of place for definitions and for exceptions and for caveats and all that stuff. You, you don't find a lot of words in the Constitution, operative words of sentence structure that you would find in statutory law, like maybe <laughs> or maybe or shall not, or there's just certain things that don't appear. Uh, and there's other examples. Um, the point being, there's no definition for insurrection in this amendment, nor does that definition appear anywhere else in the Constitution. Interesting argument. It seems to, again, make the point that the 14th Amendment was pretty well self-contained because they didn't have any question knowing what they were talking about. Insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution. Rob, so we have to go back to now what, what's happening in this debate is people are going to the local dictionary and pulling it up saying, oh, let me tell you what insurrection is. From Oxford Dictionary, a violent uprising against an authority or government. Okay. A violent uprising against authority or government. So that's um, now that's going to have a certain amount of merit in court because in a courtroom, the, the common dictionary language is often brought in to describe things. Merriam-Webster an actor instance of revolting against civil authority or an established government. Okay, so is the, 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 were the protests that happened in the summer of, 20, uh, of 2020, were, were, those, were those protests insurrection or were they just protests? You're talking about Antifa? Mm -hmm. uh, Antifa, Black Lives Matter. Uh, 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 they were, in certain areas, they were attacking federal property with the goal and of- And state property and county property, city with property. With the goal of- destroying or killing the people inside and burning those places to the ground. Yes, I would say that. But that they were was... never, th they never reached the threshold of legal um, prosecution to have been involved in the 14th Amendment. So I guess insurrection is in the eye of the beholder. And well, at this who stage, would you, who would they have come after for the 14th Amendment um, in, in those cases? The people that directly participated. Okay. Yeah, and they and they would have been held in federal prisons, and they would have been held and prosecuted uh, in regards to insurrection. Now, people, people were arrested right. and prosecuted, but not on grounds of insurrection or right. rebellion. Now that brings up another question about the Fourteenth Amendment. However, you will notice that the Fourteenth Amendment is not a criminal statute. It's not designed to do that. It was specifically designed to deal with people who had been in the rebellion of the Civil War. You can't say it's anything other than that and be honest to the history of it. Because if they'd wanted it to be a universal criminal proceedings in regards to anybody who broke a, a, a federal doorknob 
or, you know, crack the window, then it would have had criminal, but it, there's no criminal proceedings. It's simply a point of DQ. It's about disqualifying a person. So it's for elected officials. From serving in elected mm -hmm. office. It's for someone that attempts to be an elected official from running. Right. Correct. Right. Well, I was just going to say in the course of this, there still are people that were uh, held as basically political prisoners in all of this. And um, I think the concern that when we hear all of this is we are orchestrating deliberately to make them appear as though they are insurrectionists or they are a danger to the country. The people that are being held mm -hmm. from January 6th are, are in fact caught in this legal problem. Of definition. Waiting for their speedy trial yes. right. after but, two years. But again, you said this is not, the 14th Amendment's not criminal. Uh, yeah, it's not. I mean, they're not Confederate officers and they're not seeking political office, but they're being held uh, for undetermined lengths based on what? Well, they called the event insurrection and Congress affirmed it through all of those hearings that they had, the great big hearings and that resulted in the impeachment of Donald Trump for participating in an insurrection. Now that the impeachment is one thing, that was the House, the Congress then as the Senate did not convict. So there's a difference between being impeached and convicted. But all of those proceedings hinged on one operative reality, and that's that what happened on January 6th was in fact an insurrection and or rebellion against the United States Constitution. And, and therefore, a person seeking, who had held the oath of office, then seeking office anywhere else, would be disqualified. That's the whole DQ argument. And, and the proof of the fact that it's been a strategy is that five days after January 6th, Bloomberg ran the first story on this. And, and the theory was laid out within six days, within five days, it was laid out, it was in the marketplace that Donald Trump was now disqualified because of the insurrection. Then it sat there for a whole bunch of time. And suddenly now it's the hottest thing in American politics. Everybody's on the DQ train. There's people in states and people at Secretary of State's office. There are political parties. There are lawyers. There are independent people. There are all kinds of people running around saying Donald Trump is disqualified. And you know it became real because all of these forces suddenly came together and they stuck all their paperwork together and they took it to the Atlantic and the Atlantic ran the article. And if you know anything about how the left works in American public life, if you're about to have a major movement thrown into the American political cycle, it comes through the Atlantic. They are they are the marquee place where it hits. If it plays on the Atlantic, it's got to be real. And all of a sudden, the Atlantic's out saying, hey, here comes Lawrence Tribe and a former federal judge appointed by H.W. Bush saying, you know, we've been looking at this and doggone, that is insurrection. That is rebellion. Donald Trump's disqualified. Well, then there's the 126 pages that were written by these lawyers, these two uh, Republican lawyers who allegedly are part of the Federalist Society who said the same thing. I read the 126 pages. I would have got flunked if I'd brought that into a Supreme Court class. All right. In a master's class, I would have, I, that, I would have I, maybe a C minus, probably a failing grade. Not very good scholarship. But then again, they wrote it. Everybody glommed it all together. And now the hottest thing going, DQ Donald Trump. He can't run again. So the, the Proud Boys were recently convicted uh, what were they convicted of? And some of them are given a dozen years, 18, 18 years. years. Yeah. Okay. What What were the charges? Insurrection and rebellion, which are very specific charges, right? No, they were convicted of seditious conspiracy, uh, not of insurrection. There's a difference between sedition. Yes. The, yeah, because sedition is you're interfering with official government business mm -hmm. and Many of the people on January 6th who were inside the Capitol were interfering with official government business. Why hasn't anybody, please correct me if I'm wrong, why hasn't anybody been charged yet with insurrection? Because there is no criminal platform to, or to rebellion. Do that. No, you, there's, it's, it's in the amendment. There's no criminal follow through. There's no statutory matchup. It, it just disqualifies it you just from, disqualifies holding, you from office holding office ever again. again. Okay, so right, how can you about. charge? Uh, Trump of rebellion, excuse me, rebellion or insurrection, when none of the people who were there, who were actually doing oh, criminal he drops things, the shoe on the argument. I see where you're going. Yeah, how they're not. In other words, they needed to they, be. They, if yeah. anybody should have been charged with insurrection and rebellion, it would have been people like the Proud Boys. But right? the Fourteenth Amendment but they, but was no, designed no, for something quite yeah, different. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and there's yeah. no crime for. 
the insurrection Did aspect. you see that, Jeff? He, he, like, he just thank you. He just I've like, been, like, he thanked I watched, the court and he sat down. He does no further questions. Your I Honor. watched I got Perry it. Mason when I was a okay, kid. They're so, very, very well done. Yeah. Right, so this is the kind of argument that we've got going. Now, it, this is a hot topic. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. It's, it's tricky. This is tricky. If these folks are paying close attention now, um, it, they are going to get attention in the courts. And, and when we get back, we'll tell you why. All right. Thanks, Dave. And let's take a moment to thank our listeners to the Public Square for your support of the American Policy Roundtable and this broadcast, the Public Square, which has no other means of support except from our listeners. So we appreciate you very much and always enjoy hearing from you. You can contact us through our website, thepublicsquare.com. More coming up. We will be right back for more on the Public Square. We're deep into the conversation on the Public Square today about the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. If you joined us late, why don't you go back online at thepublicsquare.com and listen from the beginning. You may want to share this program with other people, or you can also use our smartphone app, The Public Square, and that's convenient because you can download this program and listen at your convenience. Just look for The Public Square in your app store. All right, back to the conversation at hand. All right, sure, you had a question. I did. Um, I guess my question would be, Davis, why doesn't the same reasoning apply to the behavior and actions of congressmen, um, people that have called for violence in public places. Oh, there, this is this is happening. It's such a two-tiered. The, oh, but but no no there is there there was a court hearing. I think it was uh, was it a county? Yeah, there was a county official out west who was by a federal judge was stripped of his ability to serve in office because he was there on January the sixth. Yes, so th- it has happened. But I'm talking in in our past history, or oh. even even when um, when Maxine Waters had called called out for people <laughs> to. Um, that How was, about Chuck Schumer calling out the yeah, Supreme Court? I know. How about them? Eric Swalwell sleeping with Chinese communist spies, and yet there he still is in the United States House of Representatives. That's what I'm talking about. Is it seems like if we're going to apply this, then we have to apply this all the way down the line. Well, and, and to add to that. This insurrection would have to be specifically against the Constitution. Excellent point. Not ju- not an administration, mm-hmm. not 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 Congress. The not Constitution. breaking a glass window in the quote temple of democracy, How which was that for which we said was wrong. Which and, of course and, yes, was yes, wrong. Yes, yes, Criminal yes, trespassing, yes. and they should. They. I don't have any objection with prosecuting the people for breaking the law where they did right. uh, uh, criminal trespassing. All that. I, I get all that stuff. Hey, I got to pay for the glass to be repaired. I'm not happy about it. Okay, it's all of our house, but it's not the temple of democracy that it's being. I mean, come on. The the language here has been absolutely absurd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I didn't like it when protesters broke broke the windows in the city of Cleveland. And I didn't like when the protesters uh, broke windows in the Capitol. Right. So so, so that that's there's no defense for the the criminality of the action. The question is, how does it all connect? Which is sure that you're asking. You're asking the same question. How does it connect? Well, they call the 14th Amendment self-executing. In other words, it sits on the shelf until somebody comes to use it. Now, the reason it hadn't been used for a while is because the people who built it to use it decided by amending it out according to the proviso contained within, they didn't need it anymore. Okay? And we haven't had a civil war since. But now the question, yeah, thank God. Yes. Now the question becomes, really what we should be asking is not was January 6th an insurrection, but was it a civil war? Was it a battle or the start of one? Yeah. I mean, okay. Uh, well, and, and because if it was the start of one, then where are the troops marshaled? Where was the second step? Where was the, where, where does the third step, the fourth step, the fifth step? Also, it, it, there weren't a lot of weapons there uh, yeah. either, which thank God. And the only person that died yep. was a former was Ashley Babbitt, was Ashley Babbitt, who was executed yep. unarmed yep. by a Capitol police officer who has been, who has been promoted by the way. Yeah. So I mean, those are facts. That's that is that those are the facts of the matter. Doesn't make any of it right. It's all wrong. But those are the facts. And how many times are we told that we're entitled to our opinion but not our own facts? Well, those are the facts. Speaking of opinion, what has Donald? What did Donald Trump say 
on January 6th. You know, what? I'm going to respectfully ask if we could avoid that for just a second. Okay, sure. All right? sure. Be- because because it's we're, it's been amazing. We've had this entire conversation. Uh, we're almost out of the show already. We haven't even talked about Donald Trump yet, have we? Not much. Because we're trying to describe the event. Yeah. All right. All right. Now, what were we going to ask? What has he said? What did he say on January 6th that was... Uh, planning, plotting, executing an insurrection or rebellion. I've listened to everything he said publicly on mm-hmm. January 6th. Yeah. He did not, in my opinion, he did not say one single solitary thing advocating for rebellion or insurrection against the Constitution of the United States. He was, hope, he was saying, hopefully Mike Pence will do the right thing and invalidate, and I'm paraphrasing, invalidate the election. Yeah, he was appealing to the rule of law yes. in that case. Okay. Yeah. Is it possible that if if you two were lawyers for Trump in this in this conversation, that you'd say that the intention of the administration was actually to uphold the Constitution? That's what I would say, yes. Yeah. I mean, he wanted it used in his favor, but and yes, he was appealing to it's it. It's interesting that the framers of the 14th Amendment put the Constitution in the language. They didn't put the words the government. Mm-hmm. Because the Constitution is bigger than a single event, and they also and it's believe bigger in than the a rule single law. They, it's bigger. It's bigger than a single uh, uh, election, and so to reach the, the threshold where you are actually in insurrection, rebellion against the Constitution, is a whole lot bigger issue than a question of criminal trespassing. That's why there's no criminal trespassing in the amendment. In other words, this is an exciting debate to look at the fact that words mean what they say, and they say what they mean, and and that th- these words can be understood, but. It's called self-executing, which means it sat on the shelf as an interesting history lesson until the Congress decided that what happened on January 6th was insurrection, and suddenly all the other dominoes started to fall. So here's where we are with the DQ question on Donald Trump. Anyone, and we've had lawyers doing it, we've got political uh, leaders doing it, we have state legislatures talking about it, we have judges involved now. Anyone can attempt to remove Donald Trump from the ballot in their state. You can appeal to your secretary of state and say he shouldn't be on the ballot. You could appeal to your county elections board and say Donald Trump shouldn't be on the ballot based on the 14th Amendment. Now, some pretty high-placed people are are promising to do some pretty strong. Let's see, we've got an article that came out recently from, this is actually from a Republican. John Anthony Castro recently threatened Donald Trump with, quote, legal blank. We'll, we'll say the word, it, it, Hades, in his latest bid to get the former president disqualified from the ballot in several states ahead of the 2024 election. How's he doing this? They're going to secretaries of state and they're saying, here's your choice. You either take him off the ballot based on the 14th Amendment or we sue you based on the 14th Amendment. Can you write him in even if he's taken off the ballot? Or a lot of states won't accept writing uh, votes in regards to that. So, so, um, you, I guess you can. So people would be disenfranchised then. Gee, that sounds illegal. So isn't this a manipulation of our Constitution? We've got a tax attorney in Florida that's coming to federal court saying you've got to remove Donald Trump from the ballot because I'm a citizen. The 14th Amendment is self-executing. I'm executing it. And he, this is, Congress called it an insurrection. He was impeached for insurrection. It, clearly that's insurrection. He can't be on the ballot. Now, you know what? At one level, that's a very powerful argument. The words match, don't they? And is, so if I go from January 11th, when it was declared an insurrection, and I go to the words insurrection used over and over and over again, then it must be an insurrection must be an insurrection. Now, what was your question? <laughs> manipulation. <laughs> yeah, manipulation. Well, and, and this is where, you, obviously, you can't go back in time, but uh, this is where Donald Trump, in my opinion, is his own best friend and his own worst enemy at the same time. <laughs> you know, it, you keep yeah. giving people uh, ammunition to fire against yourself. You know, it's probably not wise to whip up a crowd of thousands and tell them to march to the Capitol. Now, he didn't tell them to, he, did, he told them to do it peacefully. He said, I get all that. He said he would be in their lead. Yeah, which he wasn't, which in, he wasn't. In, re- in retrospect, I'm guessing that yeah. virtually anyone that had anything to do with that day at all had wished they'd never gotten out of bed. Yeah. I, I mean, I, there's, it's just, it, there's, there's nothing in it that makes any sense at the end of the day. It, it, it was now, but we're taking it out of context, out of respect to the people who were there. 
the world looks very different today from the way it looked for them that morning. Well, I mean, I, I watched the entire thing on TV. Yeah. But, you know, watched, we all watched it unfold from our various vantage points. And, yeah. You know, so it's it was and, and bizarre. It was, it was bizarre it at was the very least. Yeah. Very well said. Now, who would have thought that it would have been played into a strategy to prevent Donald Trump from running again? And this is now what's happening around the country. The question becomes, of course, will these activities succeed? But one thing to be certain of is they are real, whether it's coming at a secretary of state or a county election official, whether it's going into the legislative process or directly into courts. There are people who have now seized upon this argument across the country, and they are absolutely convinced that this is the methodology of removing Donald Trump from the ballot so that his attempted candidacy for the presidency, whether it would be as an independent, which is highly unlikely, or as the nominee of the Republican Party, would be, in essence, stricken from the record and people in those states wouldn't be allowed to vote. And Dave, as you said early in the broadcast today, listeners should not construe this in any way as an endorsement of any particular candidate, which is something we don't do here at the Public Square. Okay, we're aware that some of you have to leave us now. The rest of this program, of course, can be heard online at thepublicsquare.com. For the rest of you, we'll be back in just a moment. an interesting conversation today on the Public Square with our team. Dave Zanotti, Sherry Eisen, Rob Walgate, Jeff Sanders, and Alan C. Duncan. All right, we've got a few more minutes left to the broadcast, and then we'll be done for this week's edition. You can go back and listen again at thepublicsquare.com. Dave? Rob, you're next in the queue. What was your line, your question? I'm just thinking throughout this all that both sides of the aisle seem to be addicted to Donald Trump. They both need him. Both sides, you know, one side would say they want him in office. The other side needs him to raise money and for ratings. I mean, anytime his name is mentioned or he's charged with anything or rumored to be charged with something, how many fundraising emails go out? Well, this goes back to the original discussion right at the beginning of this, of this broadcast, understanding that presidential elections are about controlling the federal budget, all that power, largest budget in the nation. There's no company that even can compare with the federal budget. And then controlling the administrative state, which which has massive ramifications around the globe. Okay. Now, will this effort succeed? It might. And here's why. There are some secretaries of state that would say, yeah, I agree with you. It's self-executing. He's off. Yeah, politically. There, there might be some federal judges. Remember, the federal judge, the, uh, the federal judiciary is a tiered system. You start... With a district court judge, single judge, luck of the draw, there's districts across the country. There are a number of judges in those districts. You bring your case in and, and it's assigned and it's assigned at random. So if you get an anti-Trump judge, they could easily say, yep, I've been waiting to, get, to take a shot at this. Glad it fell to me. Absolutely 14th Amendment applies. Then it's going to go up to the circuit court. And depending on what the circuit court's made of, conservative or, or, or liberal judges, they may agree or disagree. So you, the federal uh, judicial system is going to be involved. Secretary of State may do it arbitrarily. In that case, the Trump people have to sue the Secretary of State in federal court to try to overturn that decision. All right, so it's it's now uh, so it's it's coming inevitably if they play the strategy out. It's got to go to the Supreme Court, right? Right. Which Rob is your favorite place for all things to be decided? Nine people in black robes are going to tell us what. Day of the week it is. I mean, they tell us everything. That's what we depend on. The founders would be furious with the methodology we use today. So it's going to go to the Supreme Court. But isn't this taking, based on the conversation that we've just had and the history of the 14th Amendment, isn't this taking that choice away from the people? I know one thing, Sherry. It is going to be the most interesting court decision. It's, it's got to go there. And it, you know what? It's got to go really fast. Well, Sherry, it's funny you mentioned that. That's something that I wrote down in my notes. It, you, you had over 74 million people that voted for Donald Trump in 2020. They're, they're not just disappearing. Right. W w they can win or lose at a ballot box uh, in 2024, but they're not going away. And how are they going to feel if they don't even have an opportunity right. uh, to vote for somebody because a judge decided that? Or the other party set it up to hand it to a judge? Yes. Well, just how is that going to help the morale of our nation? Mm -mm. That's my question. 
When is the last time a Supreme Court justice had rec- has recused themselves from a case, number one? And number two, if they do, are they replaced? Um, like, I, I'm embarrassed to ask that on the air because my mind's racing. I know, I, you know, we do so much stuff in state Supreme Courts, and I know justices are, you know, you have fill-ins that come in. Here's the point about the Supreme Court. If you recuse yourself because you were appointed by a given president, then anytime the government brings a case, you would be subject to recusing. You, you, yeah, you've got. So this is where no, there's not a tradition of rec- right. recusal in that regard. And I, to tell you the truth, I can't think of anyone on this court that I would, I would personally would hope to see recused. I would love to hear the courts. I'm sorry. I'm just. It would be such a fascinating history lesson. Uh, is this where I need to say I miss Scalia though? Well, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, though I got to tell Thomas you, Thomas is going to get close. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. And and Alito is there, there's there's a lot of thought. Yes. Uh, thoughtful people on this court. They have some very interesting things Actually, to say. Actually, they do. Even I, the ones I disagree with, they're still interesting. I, I am very surprised. Uh, Kagan and Alito recused more than 130 times each, it says. This is from BloombergLaw.com. Uh, with roughly 100 recu- uh, recusals for Amy Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, Neil Gorsuch, uh, about 60 for Roberts. Uh, but those Breyer, may not always Sotomayor. be on the full cases. Yeah, okay. All right, they may recuse themselves at different points of different kinds of decision that the court has to make. Okay. Because, you know, it, it's it's quite a difficult thing to get to the docket. Now, speaking of the docket, this has not been a case that's been brought to the court. If, if the cases were brought to the court in the order and sequence that would normally follow, this wouldn't be happening until next year, well past the primaries, into well into the primaries. I mean, how at earliest the court could rule on this in its normal calendar in June of next year. Think about that. Or maybe October. So you're it's saying it. this could have election ramifications. <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> just a little. Just, just a few. And for the so, record, Supreme Court justices are not replaced. I did, you know, right. it, like the state Supreme Court. Right. So just to get that so, out. So, yeah, so you could, yeah, you, you, you go with a lower number. The, yes. the, the, the challenge is, the court's shadow docket. In other words, they, they, they continue to have the opportunity to hear cases that are not in the normal formal process. And this one, not only would they have to hear it, they'd have to hear it by Christmas because wow. the primaries begin in January. Wow. So yeah. we're right on the doorstep. So this, the reason we wanted to bring everybody into the conversation is because this is not just happening now. This is happening like now. <laughs> it's right now. And this is most likely going to be something that is going to work its way through several different courts. They'll rule different ways. Uh, the Trump people are going to have to get involved in defending themselves uh, against some. And in other cases, you know, they'll be, they'll, they'll, it'll, it's going to go all over the place, but it's going to end up at the Supreme Court. And then we'll get the answer as to whether the 14th Amendment is self-executing and whether it actually does have this current meaning and all, all this. What a fascinating conversation. And there's some that say the far left would want Donald Trump to be successful in being allowed to stay on the ballot because there's some that believe that's the only candidate that the left can beat, just like they did in 2020. So there's strategy in all this as well. The left may know they're not going to win in this battle, but they want to win the war. There is, of course, there's strategy. That's a good point. And if all this energy had been put into using it for the common good of our people instead of the division, mm. we would be so much further ahead. I, I guess it is human nature that we tend to avoid facing truth until its absence makes it imperative for well, us to look at it. And and Wayne, I've got to I've got to help us out of this now because once you get into the conversation about the presidential election, and once you bring Donald Trump and Joe Biden into the conversation. Now we're dealing with the polarized feelings that people have about all of this. Okay. I hope people can understand if you've listened to us long enough, and if not, go back and listen to some broadcasts from years gone by. We get it. America is what we do. We've been doing it for 43 years. We care about liberty immensely. We don't care about the political parties. We care about the right thing being done the right way for the common good. We believe in concepts like love your neighbor as you love yourself. And, and, and nowadays, when you don't come out punching somebody, you're viewed as weak or spineless or, or, or part of the enemy camp. No. Look, we've studied the Civil War long enough to know that punching people's dangerous. People punch back. Yeah. It's not smart. And punching people and having an attitude of rage and, 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 
and and all of that stuff somehow just doesn't wear well with a Christian testimony. Now, I understand that these candidates, and particularly Donald Trump, bring bring out very strong emotions for, in some cases, for a lot of good reasons. Because people care immensely about the country and they view Trump as someone who's solving or at least calling out the real problems. I get that. No one is criticizing anyone's passion. But what we're saying is we can't solve this with passion alone. This is a question of law, it's a question of history, it's a question of truth-telling and honesty, and it's a question of massive political strategy. One thing we can say for certain, when that first article hit five days after January 6th, before anyone was necessarily branding this as an insurrection, the plan clearly was to take that word and make it into something. Now we know what the plan was. And now we can see it with our very eyes. All right. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, everyone. And thanks for your support listening to The Public Square each week. You can reach us through our website, thepublicsquare.com. For the team here, I'm Wayne Shepard. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time for The Public Square. Public Square is a broadcast service of the American Policy Roundtable.